So hi, folks. I'm uh, Josh Lewis. I'm a front-end developer at IASD. And um, we're doing some cool stuff that integrates uh, D3 and Backbone, and I want to show some of it off today to you guys. So <clears throat> if you look at the two uh, frameworks, there's actually not a ton of overlap between them. You know, D3 is more view-focused. You've got things like scaling from data space to pixel space, behaviors like you know, zooming and panning, uh, SVGs, formatting numbers and dates and so forth. Whereas uh, Backbone is much more model focused. So events when the model changes, um, pulling data from REST APIs to hydrate your models, routing, et cetera. Where they do overlap though is in binding data to the DOM. <clears throat> they overlap there, but the approach that they take is pretty distinct. Um, D3 is focused a little bit more on rendering collections of data elements to collections of elements in the DOM, whereas Backbone provides more of a traditional model view pattern. So in, later in the talk, we'll dig into the details of that distinction, but first let's talk about some, some past work, including a past talk uh, that was given to this uh, user group. So first of all, a couple years ago, uh, Mike Bostock uh, wrote this influential post on reusable charts. Um, and so I think the question, one of the questions there is how to build up from the D3 primitives, like axes or the SVG elements that you create, to um, reusable components that roughly map onto the kind of things you might build in a piece of software like Excel or something like that, like a pie chart with labels or something. And some folks, you know, took that really to heart, right? So you've got like the NVD3 project um, that does just this. It kind of provides these uh, packaged little components uh, that let you create certain types of visualization. I think for some people though, including myself, wrapping up all this chart configuration in a monolithic closure um, feels a little bit disorganized. I think there's some question as to how that approach would scale to uh, you know, a large-scale client-side web application where you've got multiple views backing onto the same data. Can you scale that up, right? So <clears throat> last year, uh, Yuri Tulos uh, gave a talk to the same group uh, that looked at how we might use Backbone to provide some of uh, the extra, some extra structure to reusable charts. And so in his, uh, in his presentation, uh, he was showing how configuration could be attached to uh, backbone views as properties uh, to kind of add a little bit of the uh, object-oriented style organization uh, to these reusable charts. Um, and one arguable downside with this is that he's having to manage his configuration with customized uh, getters and setters building custom code. So later on in the talk, we'll look at, okay, can we, can we push this forward a little bit and do something that uh, actually leverages Backbone even more? <clears throat> but first, um, let's, let's talk in a little bit more detail in how D3 and Backbone differ in their approach to binding data to the DOM. So D3 binds data directly to DOM elements, whereas Backbone binds data to a model and then one or more views will sit on top of that model and determine how they want to render uh, the data to the DOM. And that method of rendering things out is, is up in the air, right? You might use a template, you might use some, some other methodology. Backbone's very agnostic when, once you get up to the uh, view level. If you're working backwards to your data and your elements, then in D3 you can just, if you know how to find the element in the DOM, you can wrap it in a D3 selection and that gives you access to a combination of the DOM element itself, its attributes, et cetera, and also the data that's attached to it. Whereas with Backbone, the, the view is kind of the locus of this information, but it's represented separately, where you have basically a jQuery or Zepto wrapped DOM element for, for, for uh, DOM manipulation. And the model attached to the view is what represents the data. In the case where your data is a collection, uh, D3 has a very similar approach. So again, you can select all on the uh, collection that you have in the DOM and work back to the data. 
And for Backbone, you need to, it's an exercise for the reader, how you want to manage the mapping between collection data and a view. You could either render something out to a template that has some loop and maybe some data ID tag in the DOM element so you can index back into your collection. You might, um, you might have a bunch of subviews that get rendered uh, for each model in the collection and attached to the parent view. There are a couple ways to go about it. So at IOSD, we run into a particular kind of case of data structure pretty frequently. Um, and so I thought I might take you through it. So what we're looking at here is this top level logical entity in our uh, data analysis software, which uh, we call a network. And it's really a graph. It's a collection of uh, nodes and edges. And it has some sub collections like uh, different colorings that you can apply to the graph that determine what uh, the nodes are colored as and uh, different node groups that a user is defined. So right now all the nodes that are selected in white up there are, uh, are like a potential node group that the user could name and kind of save for later. Um, so when we look at this view, we're rendering the, the network graph itself. We're rendering a list of the uh, node groups that are, the user has defined uh, on this graph. We're rendering this list of color schemes. And then down here, if you can see it, we've got a histogram showing the distribution of uh, coloring values over the different nodes in the graph. So we've got this kind of rich object, this rich artifact that we're pulling down from our back end that we want to we wanna render out to the, to the DOM. So what does that look like at the JSON level? It looks something like this. So we're pulling down uh, from our API uh, some metadata about the network. And then we also include some sub-collections that have these associated elements. Um, so we get things like the ID, the name, you know, some of the uh, configuration properties for, for generating the network, um, and then child collections and their properties. At first blush, it's a little bumpy rendering this holistically with either D3 or Backbone. So for D3, we've got this data object. And it's not that natural, though obviously it's possible, to attach a single high-level object to a parent element and then kind of fill it in. Where, where D3 really shines is in you know, uh, rendering all the uh, DOM elements for the, for the sub-collections. But that one-to-one -one correspondence is a little bit against the grain. On the Backbone side, the, mod the top level model to view relationship is really clean and really natural for Backbone, which likes to have a one to few relationship to views in general. But as we talked about before, rendering the collection out to a bunch of subviews ends up generating a lot of bookkeeping. If you do a subviews, it feels a little bit heavy because you have a, a new view that you're creating for every single model in the collection. If you do it with the template, then the reverse indexing could be a pain. It's, uh, it's a little annoying. So the approach that we've taken, <clears throat> and this is similar to the approach that, uh, that uh, Yuri espoused, is when you have models with lightweight child collections, we render those child collections with D3 directly to the DOM without wrapping them in any kind of backbone infrastructure. And we get some nice things for free there, right? So if we've set up our enter and exit uh, functions on the, on the uh, D3 selection, then we'll get partial view re-renders uh, for free if the model state changes or if we sort or something like that. And then we use a backbone view for the parent, uh, uh, which gives us the best of both worlds. So uh, from our perspective, even though it looks like D3 and backbone would end up conflicting in this function of binding data to the DOM, we're finding that they're actually quite uh, complementary. And so we'll get into that in a little bit more detail here, but first I want to show a quick demo of one of our products to kind of motivate the stuff we're going to see next. All right, so this is what we were looking at in the image before. And what we've got here is a, uh, is a network uh, composed of these nodes and edges, and we can you know, brush inside the network to make selections. Um, if we've got a selection that's unique, we have the ability to add a, uh, add a node group um, to the list. We've got different colorings that can uh, alter how the, uh, 
how the network is, is colored. And we can also make selections on this histogram down here where we select just those nodes that are in that range of the histogram. And as you can see, when I'm making these selections on the graph, the values in the other views are uh, unsurprisingly automatically updating. So if I make a selection here, I see the corresponding selection happen in the histogram. I'm also updating my node and rows count. I'm updating the uh, average node coloring value for these different coloring schemes. So we've got this, this UI composed of multiple views. They're all pointing towards the same top level model object, but they're kind of focusing on different uh, sub elements of the model. And the other nice thing we've done for our users is that you can go ahead and back out through all of these operations that you've done, including the creating, creation and deletion of the node groups and um, the, the various selections. So you get that undo redo. All right. So, so how do we go about stitching this all together? We ran into some kind of unique challenges when, when building this. So first of all, when we look at this display, we've actually got four mostly independent views, right? We've got this, this graph representation, we've got the list of groups, we've got the list of colorings, and we've got the, uh, the histogram down here. Now, they, they share the same model. They also share some of their interaction state. So the notion of a node selection is, is relevant to all of these views. They want to listen for that and re-render themselves in some way when that event happens. Um, so the question, the question that we have is how do we represent that interaction state without building explicit dependencies between views, which would be the natural way. If the views knew about each other, then they could, they could uh, talk directly. Um, and we're motivated to reduce these interview dependencies uh, so that we can do things like this. And this is a, just a kind of zoomed in screen grab from a prototype project we have where you can see that we've got, you know, multiple network views. We've got another kind of view down here. And you can see compared to the previous slide that we've, you know, pulled out some things like the histogram. We've added some things like this overlay that shows the network configuration. So we want to be able to kind of tear out and add views willy nilly uh, without having to do a bunch of uh, upkeep. So for the, for the remainder of the talk, uh, we can look into with a little bit of detail into how we use Backbone to track interaction state across different D3-based views. All right, so where are some candidate places to store interaction state? Spoiler alert, we've tried all of these, or we've used all of these, I guess I should say. Um, you could store state in the DOM, and that's really natural for something like a list that's either open or closed, and you just toggle that class on the list, right? It's a natural place for that state. It's something that's specific to a specific view. You can take the towards reusable charts view and wrap things up in widget specific closures. You can attach the interaction state to backbone views, or you might attach it to backbone models uh, because you, want, you have multiple views backing onto the model and you want some centralized place to, to locate the state. So the first three are prob problematic because they all create uh, interview dependencies, right? So if you store it in the DOM, then the other views have to know where in the DOM to go look for the state. And similar for the views and the closures, they need to hold references to each other. And that makes the, the setup a little bit brittle or at least less componentized. If you hold the state in the model, um, it's not ideal for two different reasons. One, you could hold it in the model as a backbone model attribute, right? Which is tracked and fires change events and gives you all this kind of nice machinery. But then when you persist that model to your REST API, you're going to be pushing up all this interaction state. And your API is going to be like, you know, what's, what's an x-axis, right? It has nothing to do with the kind of logical uh, existence of this network. If you don't put the state in the model attributes, but rather you attach it as properties on the model, then you end up having to do lots of boilerplate, right? Because you're going to need setters and getters. You're going to need to be triggering events on yourself to let uh, views know when, when nodes have been selected in, in this uh, case. Um, it works, and we actually did it this way uh, for a while. But it becomes uh, kludgy, and it, it doesn't scale as well. <clears throat> so 
our approach is to have a special kind of backbone model that explicitly supports user interactions that we call an interactions model. And the purpose of an interactions model is to allow backbone views or models to register named interactions, right? Um, so here's a, we can jump back to the code in a sec, but here's a diagram of how that works. If you have some backbone object that wants to track user interaction, it wants to get events, it wants to get all the, the nice stuff that um, backbone models provide, the viewer model object can register a named interaction, like let's say selected nodes, with that interactions model. That interactions model then creates getters and setters on the uh, requesting object and also uh, creates that attribute in itself to track the state of the interaction. Then when it sees events happening on itself related to that interaction, it will forward those events, trigger them on the original requester, and then the dependence of the viewer model that are interested in observing that state um, can listen to those interaction events and then use the getter and, getters and setters that were created to get and set the interaction state. Um, so what's nice about this is though we do have this, this separate entity, the interactions model, and this could be something that's global, it could be something that's created on like a uh, you know, top level view, uh, you could choose how many of these you want to have. Even though this thing is existing in the background and providing a lot of uh, uh, backbone machinery, the dependent entities in your application have no idea that it exists. So if we hop back to the code, it's literally about this long. Um, we just have a function that lets you add a named interaction. Um, so how would you contrast with an this with an event bus? Well, it's, it's kind of like that, right? Because, uh, I mean, Backbone is essentially running an, an event bus to support its, its, uh, its eventing system. So in a way, we're, we're using that machinery um, to support uh, interaction tracking on the, on the client side because the normal, the normal way that your uh, Backbone events will get uh, triggered and managed is through actual changes on models but we don't want to necessarily change our you know, kind of canonical model state. We don't want to change our network model state to support interactions. And so we're kind of breaking that out, making a perhaps client-side only model, and then using the existing you know, event uh, bus that uh, the backbone has to, to build our listeners on top of. <clears throat> so if we look at the code, um, on line six, we're basically namespacing the, um, the model attribute. So we namespace it with the models, uh, the requesting model's name, just for you know, debugging and readability, plus its ID, plus the name of the event. So this might be like network C17 selected nodes. We attach D3 style setters and getters to that property of the model. And then we watch the interaction model itself watches itself for any changes to that key, gives the requesting model an option to uh, pass in a callback so it can update any internal state before its listeners are notified, and then triggers a special kind of event, an interaction event, on the model itself so its listeners will know what's going on. So, you know, 20 lines of code. So in practice, when we have a view like the one that we were looking at, we now have this separate interactions model, and anything in the system can request a named interaction. So something that's very uh, view specific, like the transform on an SVG, uh, could be requested uh, from a view to the interactions model, whereas something that's gonna be shared across views, and that we want multiple views to be able to track its state, could be requested uh, by a model. And you can also think of having the parent view do this, but th with the caveat that you'd need the children to know about the parent. So what are the wins that we get from this approach? Um, first, if you've got, uh, you know, we've set up an undo manager that tracks the state of backbone models and collections and can kind of step you forward and backwards in their state. If you have something like that, then you just register this interactions model with the undo manager and you get undo redo for free. If you're kind of paying attention to the code, we've got a way to opt out of uh, undo redo if you have very transient uh, uh, interaction states. We've also uh, created a uniform representation for the client-side 
interaction state. So before we were talking about how, you know, you might represent one piece of state with just like a, like a class toggle on a DOM element, right? Because that's all that's justified. You know, it's just is it open or is it closed? You might represent some other piece of state with like a property attached to a model or a property attached to a view or something that's wrapped up in some closure somewhere. So if you were to say, okay, I want to survey and know exactly what state my application's in, you'd have to go look, uh, you know, in every nook and cranny, right? If the application uniformly uses uh, something like an interactions model, then all the information about the state of the application is located in that model. Uh, we reduce the boilerplate because we're not having to trigger manual events like, hey, nodes have been selected. And importantly for us, this opens up the potential to persist interaction state between user sessions, right? So we've just said, you know, okay, we've put all the state of the application in one model it's just a bundle of JSON. We can just push that thing up to the server and then rehydrate it the next time the user logs in. I say that like it's really easy. There'd actually be all sorts of like ID, server ID, client ID nightmares, but you know, it's, it seems possible, right? Um, so yeah, so we feel like we've gotten several uh, substantial uh, wins from, from taking this approach. So <clears throat> from our perspective, uh, D3 and Backbone work really well, well together. I think there are like more ways we can discover that will integrate them further. And to begin with, they're pretty complementary, actually. Um, yeah, and with the right patterns, we think they can be used to build very powerful, rich uh, client-side applications. So, uh, yeah, okay, quick, quick uh, plug before I before I say uh, thanks. So we're hiring. Um, there's lots of Ayazdi folks uh, scattered around, including uh, Joe, who's our lead recruiter. So definitely seek me or him or uh, anyone else out if you'd like to learn more about what it's like to work here. Or, you know, data analysis, visualization is your thing. Um, it's a fun company to work for uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So thanks a bunch to Ian and uh, the Bay Area D3 Users Group, and then also to uh, the front end team at IOSD, Danny, Cindy, and Diana, and the rest of IOSD Engineering for hearing earlier versions of this talk. Thanks. <laughs> so any questions? Yeah. Can you talk about how um, this interaction model interact with D3? So for example, do you have to re-render the chart on every frame as soon as it hears a change? Um, <clears throat> Josh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is how exactly does the interaction model uh, interact with D3? And that's, uh, it's kind of case by case, right? So, so there are some interesting details here. I'll take, uh, I'll take one example, which is like zooming and panning around a, around a graph, right? So the challenge you run into there is that you don't want to, obviously you're gonna be incrementally updating your state constantly, right? And you don't want to, for example, push all of those minute state changes onto an undo stack. So basically what we do there is um, we are live updating the state. So you do have, you do have the, the setter happening, something watching that event, and then yeah, changing the transform property on the parent SVG. So you've got that loop. But then on the other side, um, when we're looking at like undos and stuff like that, that's all being debounced. So we're, we have some just global like timeout that says, okay, after like this thing has calmed down for 50 milliseconds um, or 500 milliseconds or whatever it is, then you know, kind of freeze that state and put it on the undo stack. Um, does that, does that kind of, that's kind of, around the question. I mean, and then other, it, it does end up being somewhat case by case, right? So if the, for example, in a, in a node selection scenario, you have the event that the nodes have been selected and that actually kicks off a D3 selection that goes through and classes the relevant nodes with selected, which will make them like highlighted in white. But then each of the views are gonna kind of handle that node selected event separately and they can, they can do whatever they want. So there's no, there's no kind of top down uh, suggestion from this, uh, approach about how you handle those events, but you definitely do want to kind of debounce stuff if you're pushing on the undo stack. You push the data towards the front end or you push the data towards the back end and just select it as events happen in the front end or how exactly do you? So that's kind of another uh, uh, fun thing that we're doing. Uh, so we don't, oh sorry, yeah. 
Um, so the question is like, what's the what's the interaction between the back and the front end? Are we pushing this data up to the to the back end often? Um, So for changes that impact models that have some existence on the back end, right, like the networks or the node groups, changes to those things, we're doing a much uh, longer timeout, like a five second timeout, where we wait for those things to settle down, and then we just automatically and silently push the state up to the back end. So basically any, any model that has an endpoint that's backing it, we're, we're always watching the changes to those models and we'll wait for them to settle and then push them. In that way, um, users don't have to click save, right? It's just whatever you do, it's persisted. And actually we have a, we watch for the, I think it's like window before on unload or I don't know, some weird event that tells you when the tab or the window's about to go away and we flush our cache when that happens, push everything up to the back end. So, so the, the back end communication is, is kind of silent and behind the scenes and is based on watching the changes on model properties. For the interaction stuff, these are kind of uh, you know, front end only backbone models. So they don't map onto any uh, back end state and they just live for the, core, for the life cycle of the front end application. Though, like I was saying, in theory, we might want to push that state up so that then we could hydrate it uh, on another user session. Have you thought about using this approach to synchronize between different clients? Like when one user interacts, that interaction could be sort of mirrored on other clients? Yeah, so like Google Docs style editing. <laughs> so the question was like, what about using this to synchronize between clients? <clears throat> it would be cool, right? <laughs> um, so, so the challenge there, you'd have the same like kind of client-side ID to server-side ID mapping. And the reason that we use client-side IDs is because you know, you don't want to, our mentality at least is you don't slow the user down for anything, right? So if we're creating like a new node group, we act like that node group exists before we've gotten the confirmation from the server that it's there. So if we had to wait around for the things to hydrate, we'd have to put in these crazy loading states and stuff like that and it'd just be a bummer. Um, so because of that though, we don't want to, it's, it's a little awkward also to like kind of sit around and write all this like special casing logic to wait for IDs to get hydrated from the server. So we just use client IDs. Um, now you can map from, there's things you can do to map from client to server side IDs or we could watch for when the ID does get hydrated and then go back and edit all the state to use server side IDs or something. So that, there'd be some, some challenges in making that work, but in theory, yes, right? Because you could just take the, you know, if, if you're looking at the same document, essentially, right? If you're looking at the same network, then you could just be pushing that state up from both clients and, 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 and then, you know, pulling it down on both sides. And you could, yeah, see someone live interacting with the network in principle. Um, yeah, that would be cool. I, did, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Yeah. How much does the does it scale on the client side in terms of the size of the network? Uh, so we're uh, we're kind of at the mercy somewhat of like SVG rendering performance on the client side, right? So if you bump this stuff up, you know, I've, I think we've tried stuff up in the like I don't know, like low tens of thousands of nodes, which means you know a lot of edges as well, and um, you know it just gets choppy. Basically, so it doesn't break, um, but the the animation and stuff like that isn't smooth, right? So if we did a selection, you know, if you do a selection on a smaller network, you know, we grow in the selection, we grow up the bars on the histogram and stuff like that, kind of adds some of this animation. All that stuff is like, you know, chunk chunk frames if you bump it up. But I think it's mainly limited by SVG rendering performance. Uh, can you uh, review again why you're steering away from MVD3? I'm trying to understand why. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't have anything. Um, I think it's a cool project. I'm not, um, I'm not like uh, saying saying that this is like a replacement for it. It's kind of an alternative, right? Because of the because of our particular use case. So I think NVD three and kind of this towards reusable charts model of building up, uh, you know, UI components is great for situations where you really do have kind of like one main widget that you want people to interact with, right? So like if you have like an infographic style like, you know, a news article or something like that, it's perfect. 
Um, but when you start trying to build applications, you know, you know, so this network view is kind of a part of this application. You can go into other views and stuff like that. You're moving all over the place. And we've got lots of different views that back onto the same model state. Then the, the notion of wrapping all this configuration and state up in one kind of monolithic closure starts to break apart a little bit. Because if you want these things to know about uh, to kind of react to what's happening in the other views, then they either have to know directly about each other, which isn't very componentized, um, or you have to kind of pull that state out anyway. And this is kind of, this is the path we've been taken on, is to kind of, okay, say, explicitly pull out this interaction state. Uh, going off the earlier question, are you uh, dealing with uh, client-side performance and rendering, like, you know, thousands of DOM elements? Uh, have you tried any uh, server-side filtering to see any like, success, like a pagination of uh, nodes or something like that? Um, yeah, so the question is like, given that there are, is this potential for um, server-side performance problems, what have we done to try to mitigate that, uh, including like server-side rendering? Um, I'm not, so I, I'll speculate a little, little bit because I haven't like really tested this, but my speculation is that the rendering of the elements out to the DOM, like just inserting them into the DOM isn't really our problem. Our problem is stuff like when we're doing transformations on SVGs and stuff like that that have zillions of elements in them. Um, so there, even if we were to render server-side and kind of push down the kind of full SVG representation, we'd still get hit when we're trying to animate client-side. Uh, not render on the server-side, but filter the amount of data coming to the client on server-side. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's where we're focused on, okay, maybe we can improve this, right? Because, you, you know, so we've got these networks and you, you have regions, right, that are very dense and densely connected. And you know, IOSD is about finding kind of the shape and the structure of your high dimensional data. We, you know, these graphs are really summaries of this high dimensional geometry. We bring it down to low D. But yeah, as you can see, they're kind of like less interesting parts of the graph where, where it's not obviously adding to the geometric structure. So you would, you would say, okay, well, what we should be able to do is take a collection of nodes that are tightly interconnected and collapse them down to one, right? That's almost a, it's a win-win. It's a win for performance and it's a simpler visual representation for the user to look at, right? So that is actually our current, we haven't done that, but that is the plan, that we want to um, have a principled way to reduce the complexity of the network on the server side and push something lightweight down to the client that still has the geometric information intact. You probably have done that a little bit already anyway, because if you're doing you know, a lot of data analysis, certainly you're dealing with data at more than 10,000 data points, right? Mm -hmm. So as a result, you've got some level of abstraction in there already, although you haven't shown it. Yeah, the well, the initial abstraction is done by this TDA topological data analysis, which is the graph construction. So the the nodes uh, that you see in that graph uh, map onto multiple points in the underlying data set, and then obviously we've gone from however many. Uh, yeah, in a way. So we could, if we if we had a bunch of nodes that had similar sets of points, we might be able to like combine them if uh, if appropriate. Um, yeah. Uh, two questions. One, um, how exactly uh, does this compare to your thick client? Like, are you building the newer version of that? And, uh, and the other one is, I, s I know that Ayazdi's thick client uses a graph layout that's proprietary. Are you doing that in the front end as well? Um, <clears throat> so, in terms of the relationship to the thick client, uh, long term we see web clients as the future. So we're working on um, uh, reducing the need for a thick client by building as much stuff onto the web as possible. That's why we're really focused on can we build desktop applications for data visualization on the web, right? Um, in terms of the graph layout algorithm, in the, in the thick line, yeah. So we do have a pr proprietary algorithm for kind of doing this layout of the graph that kind of spreads things out, right? Because you have, you know, so one of the benefits of what we do, right, is you have this like super, potentially like very high dimensional data set, you create this graph. The graph itself has no inherent dimensionality, right? But we've got an algorithm for laying it out in 2D so that you can see the geometric features. So that's a, actually a very important part of what we do is kind of representing this thing in two dimensions. Um, so that layout algorithm is, it's not super heavy, but it's, it's a little heavy, especially if you scale up the number of nodes on the client side. So our, um, our graphs are fixed, but we store the, the 2D layout 
on the server. So when you pull it down, you get like X, Y coordinates. Um, and that's probably for the near term going to be what we do, right? So you, you create a graph. We're going to run this same simulation, but we're just going to run it headless, arrive at a bunch of coordinates, and then push that down to the client for rendering. So the downside to that is that you don't get the dynamism. Like if you've seen what our Java client can do, you can kind of pull these networks around and everything animates. And it's, pretty cool, but uh, it's also computationally intensive. Uh, out of curiosity, how do you determine the convergence? Of the convergence of the, uh, the layout. So we just have, uh, you know, so we have the process running, and then we are just looking for the deltas to settle down, which is actually problematic, because there's situations where you can get like jitter, so we have a pause button. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you run into any problems with super nodes, or small number of nodes, but large number of edges? Um, you can get a lot of different stuff out of the algorithm. I mean, we've got a lot of, you know, so, so we do, you know, we focus on making a lot of parameter choices for our users, right? So we want to automate the process of generating these, these, these graphs. If you manually tweak the settings, you can get crazy things, like one massive node that has every single data point in it. You know, you can, you can, you can tweak uh, the parameters to get whatever you want. And yeah, like a central node that has a bunch of spokes coming off of it is possible. I've seen it. But if you use reasonable parameter settings for generating these graphs, you generally don't that get that kind of degenerate structure. Singletons uh, can occur, stuff like that. But that's actually probably a good question for like some of our more data science-y uh, uh, people that have worked with a lot of real, real data sets and seen some of the crazy stuff that can happen. Just a follow-up on that. So if you have to do an OLAP processing where you have to apply an operation on an entire network, how much of it do you do on the client side or is it that you send it completely on the server side and then just get the results back? So any kind of uh, heavy-duty compute type stuff, we do backend. You know, we you know this is backed onto like you know clusters of machines, and um, uh, it's not really our goal to bring the computation down to the client size co side because at some point um, the amount of time it takes in the browser is going to overtake the like wh whatever hit you take for network lat latency going to the backend, right? So. Uh, in general, we don't do anything like a compute intensive client side only. Cool. Thanks a bunch, guys.